got to record this. I forgot to record it. Right, so here we go. I have to go in and let people in who are late for the meeting, so try and come early tomorrow. Right, you can go into the waiting room and then be put in. So, as I say, organic chemistry is very important. Just a couple of things before we start. Um, right, there's a whole pile of stuff available to you on a website called Schoology. What you do is you Google Schoology, you open the page, it will ask you to sign up, right? So you sign up. Um, when you click that, it will ask you to enter an access code. You have to enter the code exactly as it is below, right? That's, and it's all capital letters and there are no spaces. So it's D95M-NVJW-VQ4PZ. A couple of people yesterday put the W down as an M. Right? So you've got to get that exactly right or they won't let you in. When you enter that, they will ask you a few questions about yourself. Um, you can tell them the truth, you can tell them lies, it doesn't matter, um, you'll get in anyway. Um, it's as well to tell them the truth, they don't bother you. Um, then you're in, right? So when you get in, um, remember your username and password, write it down. Um, now I'll give you a whistle stop tour of my Schoology page, but before I do that, if you want to contact me at any time, even now, you can send me an email on pjjsci at gmail.com. pjjsci at gmail.com. That you can email me up with questions and so on. Right? I'm not going to take questions during the lesson um, simply because. Um, there are just too many of you. We've got over 90 in the class at the moment. Right? So it would become very, very difficult. Right, so that's point number one. Let's have a look at Schoology. Let's have a quick look at Schoology. When you get into Schoology, you will see a page like this. Now you're lucky because on this page I've also got some of my biology material which you're welcome to use if you do biology and most chemists do biology. You can look at that yourself and you can see what's in it and use it as you like. But let's look at chemistry. You don't click in the folder, you click on the name, you click on that and then you get all the things that are here. So here are the lessons. We're going to start off with um, organic preparation. Now it says Ashfield, don't worry about that, that's just where I teach and I keep all my stuff there, so that's where that comes from. Um, then there's organic chemistry theory, there's an organic chemistry flowchart, which I'll show you in a second, there's a Word document and there is a, 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 a PDF document, then there's a, a PowerPoint on stoichiometry and then there's a revision book um, and then there are these folders here which are very very useful. I'll, I'll show you them in, the, in in no particular order. Right? Definitions. Right? Definitions. When you click in that folder there's only one file in it so you click in that. When you do that it comes up here like this. This is a preview this is a preview of it, right? It takes a second or two to begin with, right? So when you get the preview, it looks okay, right? Sometimes the preview can be garbled. Don't worry about that. Don't use the preview. What you do is you go to this bit here, the download button. You download it, right? It will then ask you, do you want to open it? And you answer, okay. 
and then it opens in a window. Now, here you can see it. Um, to make that small right and um, here you can see it here and the words are in blue the definitions are in bold and if you look sometimes some of the words are not bold that means they're not really required if you're asked to define an acidic oxide it lowers the ph in water once you say that or words that mean that then you will get the mark there is no need to write sentences. Keep your answers in note form and as brief as possible. If you look at these four pages, there are just four pages of them. Right? Not very many. There, on those four pages, is a pretty much guaranteed 20% in the exam. Somewhere between 10 and 20%. Now, in biology, you've got to be absolutely accurate right the key words that required are in bold and any explanations or modifications are written in italics so it's quite important um, that you learn these the second reason for learning these is that all the questions will use these words and if you don't know what they mean you won't know what the question means therefore you won't be able to answer it these ones date from 2017. I don't think there have been any new additions since then. And these are all the definitions that I can figure out have been asked. So that's important. I'm just checking to see there are people waiting. Don't seem to be. That's fine. Right, so that's definitions. Download them to your computer. Save them on your computer then you have them for your use wherever you are. So that's number one there, right? So that was that folder. If you go back here to the folder again, um, and go back again, right? there is this one here, which we'll be talking about in a minute or two, practical videos. In this are videos produced by Lennox Chemicals, um, and, and um, by the UCC and with Professor Declan Kennedy um, and his team have produced these. Um, we'll be using these today and remember that the first three questions in your exam are deal with these practicals and you have to do two out of three so it's well worth going through these and working on them. So they're all there um, just with a very brief note as to what they're about. And then if we go back again, um, we get this one here, which is called Topic by Topic. So if we click on that, what it does is it takes all the papers, all the exam papers from about 2002 up to 2016. All the questions dealing with titration, which is question number one in the exam, are all on this with the answers. If you click on it, again, you'll see the preview. Remember, the preview can be garbled, so download it and save it on your computer. So, there's a question, and here are the answers. Right? The answers are in blue, with the marks in red. Right? And if there are alternatives, Usually the or is in red. In this case it's not. I, I've made a mistake. I started off my very first line was wrong. Right? But you'll find that all of the things are there. And what you should do is you should practice doing these questions. They've asked all the questions they can ask. So if you can do all the questions that are here, you can score well. The mark you get in June will be directly proportional to the number of past paper questions you have done. The more of those that you do, the higher your mark will be. There's lots of research to show that. And then the final, so that, that's all the topics here. The final one is 
These are all the department pass papers and marking schemes. The marking schemes I have given you are somewhat simplified. The department schemes have to give all the answers. I just give one set of answers. So that's what you get on Schoology, right? And there's the code there. If you can't remember the code or if you lose it or if you're having problems, send me an email. Right, so let's get started on the actual business of what we're doing. So we're going to look at um, organic preparations. That means organic practicals to prepare something like prepare a meal, you make a meal. So with organic chemical, we make chemicals. We make certain organic chemicals and look at their properties. So let's have a look at this. Ah, right, organic preparation, the production and properties of certain organic compounds. Right? So organic preparations. First one will be the production and properties of ethene, C2H4. The next one will be ethane, C2H2. Then we'll talk very briefly about ethanol and and then we'll go on to ethanol, the properties of ethanol. Not how you make it, you still have to know how to make it, not anymore. Um, and then five, we'll talk very, very briefly about propanone. Um, then the properties of ethanoic acid, you used to have to know how to make it, not anymore. Um, and then a, a brief chat about esters. Um, and then about making soap, how to make soap, and clove oil extraction, and finally benzoic acid preparation and purifying. So that's what we're going to be going through today and tomorrow. So let's start off with the alkenes, with ethene. The alkenes have a general formula of CnH2n, that means there are twice as many hydrogens as there are carbons. They are hydrocarbons, means they consist of carbon and hydrogen only. Right? So the first member of the series is ethene. Right? The first member is ethene, C2H4. There is no methene. It does not exist. Um, why does it not exist? Because the functional group of alkenes is a carbon to carbon double bond. If you've got a carbon to carbon bond, then you must have two. You can't have a carbon to carbon bond if you've only got one carbon. Right? So the second one is propene and the, the, the third one is butene. You have to know the names and formulae of those four, of those three, sorry. Right? What is the functional group? The functional group is the group of atoms that gives the homologous series its main characteristics. In this case, it's C double C. It is a non-polar bond. Therefore, ethene is non-polar. Therefore, it is not soluble in water. Water is polar, alkenes are non-polar. The general rule is that polar dissolves polar, Non-polar dissolves non-polar, so alkenes are not soluble in water. Therefore, as a result of this, we can collect them over water. All right, just a very brief thing. Alkenes can have isomers. Uh, isomers, um, what are they? They have the same molecular formula, but different structural formulae. Not the same chemical formula, that's wrong. Although if you ask teachers, the vast majority of them would say that that's what it is. But it's not, it's the same molecular formula. And I mentioned earlier that you have to be absolutely precise with your definitions. Those of you who were waiting, I'm sorry, but here we have another one. Please come early. Right, you go into the waiting room and then I let you all in at once.
Right, so we had that. What is happening here? Right, in the case of alkenes, the isomer, the isomerization can be the position of the double bond is one thing, or for example, hex one and hex two in, or where the branching occurs, for example, four methyl pent one in and hex one in. Each of those, hex one in, hex two in, and four methyl pent one in, are all isomers of each other. They're not all isomers of hex one in, they are isomers of each other. Right? These three compounds are all isomers. Right? Unsaturated hydrocarbons, frequently asked question. Hydrocarbon is a substance that contains hydrogen and carbon only. Um, that's what a hydrocarbon is. But if you're asked to, to explain unsaturated hydrocarbon, you've got to say what unsaturated means as well. Right? So unsaturated, mean, unsaturated means it contains at least one carbon to carbon double or triple bond. And the carbon to carbon is important. It's not just a double bond, it's a carbon to carbon double bond or triple bond. Right? Unsaturated compounds are easy to identify because they react quickly with bromine, Br2 or bromine water, and which is red brown, or and they also react with acidified KMnO4, which is purple. And in both cases, they decolorize them. They go from red brown or purple to colorless, not to clear. They're clear to begin with. That means you can see through them. They become colorless. Right? So saturated is the op opposite of unsaturated. That, pardon me, means they only have single carbon to carbon bonds. Right, solubility. Right? We've talked about this already. Alkenes are nonpolar. They are soluble in nonpolar solvents. Non-polar solvents are benzene, octane, and cyclohexane. We're not allowed to have benzene in the lab, so you could have methyl benzene if you want, but cyclohexane is the one that they come across in experiments, right? Water is a polar solvent, so ethene is insoluble in water. Like dissolves like. I mentioned that to you a moment or two ago. Right. Now, let's look at how we make ethene. This is a favorite question. In the past, questions used to be on one topic. Alkenes, alkynes, um, aldehydes, carboxylic acids, whatever it is. Nowadays, they actually normally cover two experiments. So be aware of that. If you look at the past paper questions and answers, you will see this. Right. So let's talk about how we make ethene. Right. We can make it industrially. Right. And industrially, we make it by the catalytic cracking of long chain alkanes. As an example, I'm using decane, C10H22. Decane is not a long chain alkane, but it's just to give you the principle in which it works. When we heat the long chain alkane in the absence of oxygen. Why do we do it in the absence of oxygen? Because if we heated it in the presence of oxygen, it would catch fire. Right? So we heat it in the absence of oxygen and in the presence of a catalyst. A catalyst is something like porous pot or aluminium oxide would be fine too. What happens is that the molecule vibrates more and more as the temperature goes up and eventually it breaks apart and it breaks apart into any number of pieces but in this case I'm breaking it apart into three pieces if you're asked to give an example this is what you give right two of these things are alkenes and one is an alkane so we have 
here, we have 10 carbons and 22 hydrogens. So when we break it up, we still have to have 10 carbons. Two and three is five and five is 10, that's fine. And 22 hydrogens, four and six is 10 and 12 is 22. <coughs> Pardon me. If we do that, all we have to check is that we have the same number of carbons and the same number of hydrogens. If we take two alkenes and one alkane, then that will guarantee us that we have the correct numbers. All right, so as I said, the catalyst is porous pot or aluminium oxide. The products are separated by fractional distillation because they have different boiling points due to their different relative molecular masses. This process, the whole process, is done in an oil refinery carried out there for two reasons. One, the raw materials are there, all the long chain alkanes. And remember that long chain alkanes make up the bulk of crude oil. And, but the demand is for short chain alkanes, like octane. So turning these long chain ones into short chain ones is economically very sensibly, sensible. The second reason it's done in an oil refinery is because the separating apparatus, the fractionating column, is also there. So those are two reasons why it's done. That has been asked a couple of times. Right, let's look at the apparatus. Here is the apparatus, very simple, very straightforward. There's a test tube. The test tube is horizontal. The test tube is horizontal. That's key, right? In the bottom of the test tube, there is glass wool. Not cotton wool, glass wool. It won't catch fire. It won't, it won't char. What, what its purpose is to hold the ethanol. So you, you put some glass wool at the bottom of the test tube. You pour in some ethanol. The ethanol is sucked into the glass wool. You then put the test tube horizontal and the, 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 the ethanol stays in the glass wool. About halfway along the test tube, you put a pile of aluminium oxide powder. This is a white powder. You connect your delivery tube into a, a, a beaker of water and you put a test tube full of water over the delivery tube. And the bubbles come out and they collect here. Up here you get the ethene. You heat the aluminium oxide with a Bunsen burner. The reaction that takes place is C2H5OH, that's ethanol, and it's not alcohol, it's ethanol, with the catalyst of aluminium oxide, gives you ethene and water. This is called an elimination reaction because water is removed from the molecule and a double bond is formed. So this is an, an elimination reaction. You can also call it a dehydration reaction because water is removed from the molecule. But the best answer is an elimination reaction. So you need to know that diagram and be able to draw it. And you need to know the equation. Right, the Bunsen burner heats the aluminium oxide strongly and enough heat spreads to the glass wool to vaporize the alcohol. The glass wool holds the ethanol in place and stops it reaching the aluminium oxide while it is still a liquid. The aluminium oxide is a catalyst. It is not used up in the reaction. Right? We collect the ethene over water because ethene is insoluble in water. And a safety feature is that you remove the delivery tube before the heating stops to prevent suck back and a possible explosion. Now let's just go back for a second, look at the diagram. Here we are, the diagram. If I heat this, the air expands here, it comes out here, it bubbles out here. So the first lot of bubbles that come off are mainly air. Then the ethanol passes over here, it becomes ethene and water. This passes down here, the water condenses and the ethene bubbles up and we can collect it. So normally when we're doing this, we throw away the first test tube full of ethene. 
Right. If we stop heating this, it will start to cool down. When it cools down, it, the, the gas in it will contract and it will suck water along here. And it doesn't take much water to fill that tube. And then if it comes in here, it hits the glass here. The glass is still very hot, so it can turn immediately into steam and cause the thing to explode. That's what we call suck back. Right, so the ethene is formed by an elimination reaction involving ethanol. Water is removed and a carbon to carbon double bond is formed. There's ethanol, it becomes ethene, there's a double bond formed, and water is removed. Now you could, it's an equation, so you could say C2H5OH minus H2O equals C. 2H4. It can also be called dehydration as water is removed. Ethene burns with a yellow non-smoky flame. Right? It is explosive in certain proportions with air. You don't need to know the proportions. Right, the properties of ethene, well we've dealt with one or two of them already. It's a colourless gas. You can't see it. It has a sweetish smell. It burns to form carbon dioxide and water with a yellow or a luminous flame. Right? Here is the equation. You have to be able to write a balanced equation for the combustion of ethene and of propene and of butene. I'll discuss this in detail in the organic theory part. Right? The yellow flame normally um, and it's yellower than ethane. Ethane has a pretty non-luminous flame. It's kind of bluish, very little yellow. Ethane has a yellow flame. It can be explosive. It is insoluble in water. Ethane is non-polar. Water is polar. It is soluble in non-polar solvents such as benzene and octane and cyclohexane like dissolves like is the general rule. It is unsaturated, that means it has a carbon to carbon double bond, right? a double carbon to carbon bond, whichever way around you want to say it. If you want to show that it's unsaturated, there are two ways. You shake it with bromine or bromine water and it will change the bromine water from red brown to colourless quickly. Or you shake it with acidified permanganate and it will change that from pink to colourless quickly. Either of those is proof of unsaturation. So that was number one. Let's move on to number two, the production of ethane and the properties of ethane. There are lots of ways this can be arranged, but the key here is you have two things. This is a, a micro preparation, so only very small amounts are produced and used. So we have a compound called calcium dicarbide. Calcium dicarbide is a grey lumpy solid. There's its formula, calcium, Ca, carbide, C, but there's two carbides, so it's CaC2. You can call it calcium carbide or calcium dicarbide, doesn't matter which. We react this with water, which we can put in in the form of a teat pipette and drop it onto it. It will react vigorously, produce ethene, which will pass along here into this container of acidified copper to sulfate solution. And then it will pass out of this and can be collected over water. Again, it is non-polar, so it's insoluble in water. Now, Time is running out, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back one to this and actually show you how ethene is produced. Uh, which one do I want? None of those. This is the one I want. Right, so here's Schoology. We go to practical videos and we go down. Here, down near the bottom, where we have ethene. Right? So we do that. And I'm going to show you this. I want you to make notes. 
and I will interject at various places and tell you some things. So let's look at this. Experiment to prepare ethene and examine its properties. In this experiment, we will prepare a sample of ethene gas by dehydrating a substance called ethanol. Ethanol. Alan is using a chemical reaction to remove the elements of water from it. Right. If you look at it, C2H12345OH, and here we have ethene C2H4, and you can just make out the double bond in the ethene. So that's why it is elimination, removal of water with the formation of a double bond. Aluminium oxide, Al2O3, is used into reaction. This substance acts as a dehydrating agent and also as a catalyst for the reaction. Right, and also here, here is the glass wool, right? And there's the aluminium oxide. There is the ethanol, you can't really see it. It's a colourless liquid. Action. Some ethanol was poured into a boiling tube to a depth of about 2 centimetres. Some glass wool was added to soak up the ethanol. Glass wool is used to hold the ethanol in place while the reaction to produce an ethene is occurring. Using a retort stand, the boiling tube is clamped near its mouth and in a horizontal position as shown. Key bit is a horizontal position. Using a spatula, a heap of aluminium oxide is placed about halfway along the boiling tube. White powder. The apparatus to collect the ethene gas is set up as shown and the gas is collected over water. Light the Bunsen burner. Adjust it to give a blue flame and gently heat the aluminium oxide. When the aluminium oxide is being heated, it will heat the tube, that will heat the ethanol here. Ethanol evaporates at a boiling point of 80 degrees centigrade, so it will evaporate rapidly and move across the aluminium oxide. The air in here will expand and it will bubble out the test tube, out, out the end of the delivery tube, and we throw away the first test tube full because it's mainly air. As the aluminium oxide becomes hot, the heat reaches the ethanol at the end of the tube. The ethanol changes into a vapour, passes over the hot aluminium oxide and is dehydrated to form ethene. If the ethene is bubbling off too slowly, move the Bunsen burner near the ethanol for a brief moment. Allow the bubbles to escape for a short while, as these are mainly bubbles of air displaced from the apparatus. So now they're collecting it, see the colourless gas, right? Collect five test tubes of the gas. Number of test tubes doesn't matter, just collect the gas and then you're going to test the gas in various ways. Put a stopper on each test tube as it is filled. This is a beehive shelf here. Uh, it just makes collection of the gas easier and is not required.
that is collecting a, a gas jar full of it. This will be to show it burning. So you can see there's quite a lot collected from that small amount. When all the test tubes have been filled, loosen the boss head on the resource stand and raise the apparatus up so the delivery tube is no longer dipping into the water. And you can also then turn off the Bunsen burner. You could also remove the stopper. That's another way of doing it. But remember, if you do that, it will be hot. So wear heat resistant gloves if you choose that. If the delivery tube were simply left in the water trough, a suck back of water would occur since the boiling tube begins to cool as soon as the Bunsen burner is turned off. The cold water could cause the hot boiling tube to crack. In the next part of this experiment, we will examine the properties of ethene. Note the physical properties of ethene. It is a colourless gas with a sweetish smell. The fact that the gas can be collected over water shows clearly that it is insoluble in water. Otherwise, the gas would simply dissolve in the water instead of bubbling through it. We now investigate what happens when we burn ethene. Remove the lid from one of the gas jars and use a lighted wax taper. It doesn't have to be a wax taper, it could be a, a wooden splint. It doesn't really matter. It's just to keep your hand away from Apply the Apply a light to the mouth of the gas jar. See it burning with a yellow Note flame. That the gas burns flame, with a luminous flame. But no smoke. Allow the gas to burn. When it has stopped burning, add some lime water to the gas jar. Lime water is calcium hydroxide solution. So. You add it to the gas jar. And then you shake it. Replace the lid and shake the gas jar a few times. The lime water turns milky, showing the carbon dioxide has been formed when milky ethene there. burns in air. Milky ethene there. burns to form carbon dioxide and water according to the equation shown on the screen. Organic compounds burn in air to form carbon dioxide and water. Addition of bromine. Alkenes are more reactive than alkenes because of the presence of the carbon carbon double bond in alkenes. For example, bromine adds across the carbon carbon double bond to form a colourless oily compound called 1 2 dibromomethane. It's not dibromomethane, it's not dibromomethane, it's dibromoethane. Dibromoethane. He said methane, it's not, it's dibromoethane. You need to know the mechanism of that reaction as well. And remember that bromine forms a bridge compound. Solution of bromine in water is commonly called bromine water. Let's see what happens if we add some bromine water to a test tube of ethene. Place the stopper and shake the test tube a few times. Note that the yellow colour of the bromine water solution disappears. What happens here is that a new colourless compound called 2-bromoethanol is formed. The loss of the yellow colour from bromine is the standard test for unsaturation in a compound. Again, I would say always say red brown colour. Although it is yellow or brown, say red brown. That's what the inspector wants you to say. In other words, this test shows us that there is either a carbon carbon double bond or a carbon carbon triple bond in the ethene molecule. Potassium permanganate, KMNO4, is also used to test for the presence of the carbon carbon double bond in ethene. Add about one tenth of a test tube of dilute. KMNO4 to a test tube of ethene. The amounts don't matter. 
Shake the test tube a few times. The disappearance of the purple colour to give a colourless solution is evidence for the presence of a carbon and the saturated. This concludes the study of the properties of ethene. Okay, well, that's time up. So we'll leave it at that today. We'll, go, we'll start off tomorrow with the production and properties of ethene, and then we'll continue on from there. Look at the practicals if you like. Have a look at the PowerPoint, download it, and keep it. Okay, everyone, I hope that was useful to you. Remember, you have my email address, pjjsci at gmail.com, if you have any questions.